knowing that our city can't. Our city listens, and we will do what we can to address those concerns. And at the end of the meeting, if you wish to get a response or you have follow-up questions, please leave your name and email address, and I will certainly make a path for you so that you can write your name and phone number. So this is the first town hall meeting that I'm hosting and it will not be the last. So that's good. As you know, our city has faced, uh, due, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have faced many challenges. Uptick in crime, closed restaurants and businesses, as well as lots of jobs. So I hope this meeting will help us, the city, between the city and the police chief and the police department. Our goal is to build relationships with you and with all segments of our community. And most importantly, start rebuilding trust between you and the city and the Malayan Police Department. So without any further delay, I would like to call on our city manager. Let me just say a brief bio about our city manager. Not of you know, Greg and I have. He has 31 years of public administration experience and was the city manager in Modesto and Oxnard, California, prior to being appointed to the city council as the city manager in January 2018. So please welcome city manager Greg Knott. So what I like to say is, 
remember, we were on a, we were on this decline. We were doing quite well, economic development, everything was going up, sales tax revenue, and then we dropped. And so I think what we're going to see at the end of the year next year, what we're looking at is going back to where we were pre COVID nineteen. So you're still like you're still not where you would have been, um, and it's probably a two year full recovery for us when it comes to the our annual revenue. But it's 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 good. Two years and, and back up there is going to be a really good thing, and it looks very strong, and very optimistic for where our economy is headed. And so that that's great news for us. The city council will do goal setting this week. Uh, we didn't do goal setting last week last year because of COVID, and it really I think creates a little less focus when we're talking about services we provide all of you. Getting them um, together here in the community on here's what our highest priorities is always important. And so we'll do that and then we'll have a budget uh, approval process that then we'll look at their goals, the community goals, and we'll, we'll make sure the budget fits that. Um, I see Mel from um, Congressman Thompson's office here. Yeah. Everybody wants to know where my work, my Christmas present, but I'm with my Christmas present, which is our Christmas present, shall we say, of $26 million in, in the uh, American recovery plan. And um, basically, we're still waiting for direct, um, for the specific information on how we can utilize those funds. But um, some of the things we'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, supporting or bringing forward to the council have to do with, like we needed to replace the fire station where COVID didn't get to wait to get to defer that. Um, the Advanced Peace Project, which council just supported, we were moving forward with um, Council Member Brown and the council to do that. We had to hold that. And so I think there's a whole number of things. We had to use $3 million in reserves just so we could keep the level of services where we did. And so all of those things will come in and thank you. Uh, Congressman Thompson uh, for that because it really puts us back up into the into to bring us right back up to where we were a lot faster than what we had ever done. We would have had to recover and, and put money back in reserves and so forth. They weren't able to do that with that. Yeah, I'm hopeful some new pilot programs and some more things we can do with that funding too. So that's a that will be um, an exciting time for the council to deliberate. Know, how best do we use that money based on the treasury guidelines we hope for here in a couple of weeks now? So, I would say we can have a We'll talk from your island to this day um, with what Southern Lane is doing. I believe it is, it is um, the most important project that we can see our city go through because it's a whole, it's got a spectrum of things that are going to be available to our economic development. And I would say it's about momentum, it's about you know, one area for you, not another area. And I just think that that project will certainly make a huge difference for Vallejo as an entire city for, for our future. A lot of good things going on there. Economic development, we are seeing a lot of plans submitted. There's a lot of good things there. I would say to you as a community, um, we're, we're still behind where a lot of cities are in economic development. So the thing I have to do as a city manager is we have to make sure that we got the process moving through and get people to yes. And the same goes for, well, I shouldn't say I got planning commissioners here, but we got to get to yes um, in order to get these developments going. And a lot, a lot of them are, are in the works and in the process. And so I would say in closing to you is the future is, is very optimistic. It was an extremely challenging two years. A lot of other things we're working on, at least in form. Um, there's another huge one with us. And uh, I'm certainly happy to have some questions about 400 Mare Island. I think they're going to give some presentation about that. But I would be happy to uh, discuss that with you too if you have questions. It, uh, it was part of uh, my work as I began. So, with that, Vice Mayor, thank you very much for uh, having me in tonight. Great to see you all.
and your city council members and the mayor. So thank you. His name is Greg Nighthawk. <laughs> it's on the city website. <laughs> anyway, our main speaker for this evening is uh, our police chief who has been with us since November 2019. He has 26 years of police experience. Uh, he actually started when he was 16. So 26 years, how much is that and how old is he? He actually was the assistant police chief in San Jose, California, prior to his appointment as police chief for the city of Orlando. Please give a warm welcome to police chief, Johnny Williams. Loudly with 
one voice, one resolve, one mission on an issue that has gone unchecked, under-discussed, and overlooked for much too long. Speaking out against systemic racism, racism is only the beginning. The hard work of eradicating it take, requires focused listening, prayerful contemplation, and a meaningful action that long outlived the words. It has been said that we cannot legislate morality. Well, it may be true. Morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. While it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law cannot make a man love him, but it can restrain him from lynching. And I think that's pretty important also. So while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. And when you change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes and the hearts will be changed. And so there is need for strong legislation to constantly grapple with the problems we face. Martin Luther King said that in 1965, and it's still true today. There is no roadmap on how to end centuries of systemic racism and discrimination. As a nation, I believe we're finally ready to engage in the serious conversation needed to end this chapter once and for all. And I commit that the Blayle Police Department and the Blayle community will be part of that solution. In closing, as the police chief in the city of Blayle, as a community, and as a police department, we have an obligation to do no less than everything we can to foster a more just, compassionate society in both words and deeds. And as we, as we are called to serve and protect, we are called to be our brother's keeper, to embrace the principles of compassion, humility, and justice for all. As we press on for justice, we must be sure to move with dignity and discipline, using only the weapon of love, compassion, and truth. Dr. Martin Luther King said this, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Always avoid violence and retribution. But instead, we stand on the moral ground of accountability and restorative justice. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. May God bless you, and may God bless the Palaio Police Department. Thank you. Before I begin, I just, uh, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of the police department, I personally condemn the hate crimes and bigotry uh, against our AAPI community. In addition, um, I really am happy to see us standing together to uh, stop these attacks on AAPI. So we're going to give you a quick overview of the hate crimes in the city of Vallejo. The purpose of the presentation is to give you an overview, explore the impact of hate crimes, and also give you some really basic statistical information. All right, so a hate crime. A hate crime is a crime based on the motivation of a bias. That equals a hate crime. I'm gonna kind of read this. Uh, most of you probably could read it, but just in case. Hate crimes means a criminal act committed in whole or in part because of what or more of the following actual or perceived characteristics of a victim. So again, this is a hate crime. I'm gonna go over what a hate incident is next. And as you can see, one through seven, disability, gender, nationality, race or ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or association with a person or group of one or more of these actual perceived characteristics. That is a hate crime. Hate incident. A hate or bias incident is any hostile expression that may be motivated by another person's race, color, disability, or religion, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. This act does not need to be a federal, state, or tribal, or local crime. So examples of hate crimes are name calling, insults, distributing hate material in public places, to 
displaying hate material on your own. So that's a hate incident that needs to be coupled with a crime, as we spoke about earlier. That equates to a hate crime. The Vallejo Police Department has a policy on investigating hate crimes, hate incidences. This is in our uh, current Lexical Duty Manual, and it basically says the policy of the department is to safeguard the rights of all individuals, irrespective of their disability, gender, nationality, race, or ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or association with a person or group with one or more of these actual perceived characteristics. Any of these incidents are given high priority here in the police department, and I'm gonna go over those steps next. That one. A very top one says high priority is given to hate crimes without mandatory, with mandatory uh, reporting requirements. So what that looks like is, if a hate crime occurs in the city of Vallejo, a police officer will be dispatched. You call it in, a police officer will respond. It's not a phone report. Upon arrival, the officer will take the report. If there's suspect information, follow up will be conducted that moment. Supervisors are notified on all hate crimes. If we can't do the follow up that day, this particular incident will be automatically forwarded to the investigations unit or detective unit. Our detectives will then follow up, and if we can make arrests, we will. We have an outstanding relationship with the district attorney's office, and they will review the charges. In addition to that, we also have a records manager that is mandated to report hate crimes, hate instances to the California Department of Justice. That is done monthly, and we run the stats every month. Thanks, John. Okay, so hate crime statistics. In 2021, so far, we're at zero. Again, these are reported incidences. Incidences or crimes may have occurred in the city of Vallejo, but they haven't been reported so far. In the last four or five years, you can see we've had um, two in 2016, one in 2017, one in 2018, one in 2019, seven in 2020, 600% increase in 2020. We did a deep dive on those instances and we did notice they occurred after May 30th, which is five days after the death of George Floyd. And those incidents happen to be black or African American victims. Is there a correlation? Probably. Can we prove it? Not gonna be so easy. But the point is, we captured the statistics and we are noticing it. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Shining Williams, who's gonna go into the psychology of the hate and go from there. And of course, at the very end, we just have a few flat slides. We'll go over some Q&A and answer some questions before we go to the mirror. Okay, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. We thought it was really important to, for people to understand the impact of abuse and hate, the psychology behind um, a hate crime. A hate crime is just not a typical crime because not only does it affect the individual, but it also affects the family of that individual. It affects the community. Um, it affects, um, there are other effects like PTSD or anxiety that can occur because of a hate crime. So it's really important when you understand just not the statistics, but what happens personally and to the community when this happens. And that's why I wanted this slide up. It has a, a few pictures, if you can see these pictures. These are actual hate crimes that have occurred in our city. And I wanted this to be personal. So when you look at the top picture, the middle picture, and this picture here, um, there was a hate crime that occurred at Blue Rock Springs Park, where there was a lot of hate language that was written. And um, it impacted the entire community, if you can all recall. Um, another building um, that was uh, the building for Council Member Brown, there was hate crime. We actually blurred out some of the language there. Um, but that impacts the entire community. And then we thought it would be really important for uh, people to see this and to understand it. But also, um, when a hate crime happens, when you, when you see lack of trust and confidence, uh, it disrupts public order, it has a serious impact on all of us. 
And, and that's why I want to emphasize uh, this slide. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Where do we go? What's the call to action for all of us here? What's the call to action for our city? Well, I always talk about five, prevention, intervention, and enforcement. So how do we stop and end hate crime? We have to do that collectively. So how do we do that? We do that through education. And it starts with education and outreach. It starts with meetings like this. It starts in our schools. It starts in our businesses. It starts in our society and with our politicians. It starts with all of us. Um, I quit public service announcements. I think that's really important uh, in our city. And it doesn't, it's a low cost item, but it's something that we need to do to get more information out to the public. It starts with good diversity and inclusion times. Uh, in, in schools, in our businesses, in our communities, we need to have that because this conversation has to start. It also starts with good policy. Um, when we talk about enforcing uh, the laws associated with hate crimes, there's an enhancement. 422.55, when we look at that section, and we uh, do the enhancement, we need to hold people accountable so that this doesn't happen. When we talk about interventions and utilizing what we're starting with something called the Care Center at 400 Mirror Island Way, and that's bringing all of our resources together to provide trauma-informed care services to our community. So it starts with being able to do that with social services, with the National Association of Mental Health, with uh, our other community partners, but it starts there. Um, it also starts um, with training. Um, we need to have mandatory uh, training and mandatory counseling for someone that offends and commits a hate crime. Um, they need mandatory counseling as well so that they don't reoffend. So that's where it starts. In terms of enforcement, uh, you heard Deputy Chief Kim talking about that this is a mandatory, high priority um, investigation. And so, um, I personally used to oversee the hate crime detail in the city of San Jose, so I take it very personal. If we get a uh, hate crime that occurs in our city, I want as a chief of police an immediate notification and a, a very strong investigation, a strong thorough investigation. Um, so that is another uh, important piece, but the other important piece of that is being able to network with other law enforcement agencies uh, throughout uh, our county. And then reporting. Um, I can't overemphasize this. It is really important that we get um, reports. And no matter how slight, even if it's a hate incident, we need to report because that hate incident could turn into a hate crime. So it's very important um, that we have a robust system to report. Um, Oregon, I was looking at their website, and their attorney general has an online form where you think everyone can report a hate crime, and it gets distributed to local, local law enforcement. I believe that that's important, it's simple, right? But if you are targeted based upon um, those, those categories, we need to report. And so we need to make it easy for people to report that. Next slide. All right, so we're going to talk about re imaging. Um, Louise is going to be a segue for uh, Deputy Chief Kim. He's going to come up and talk about uh, the new police facility. These are some talking points. Why is the new facility important um, to fighting and combating hate crime of gun violence and all crimes? Um, simply speaking, the, our city and our community needs tools to be able to do that, to do it effectively. Um, and this is uh, part of those tools that's going to help us to do that. Right. Oh. All right, we're going to open this up for questions. Thank you, Police Chief uh, Williams and Deputy Chief uh, Mike King. Okay, so we have uh, time for a few questions as related to the hate crimes and then we'll do the presentation for the 400 year old way. So, yes, we're the action. Thank you. 
I would recommend reporting that incident. Uh, if it appears to be, you feel it to be, or if you have to think, should I report this? Yes, just come and report it. We will do the investigation and make that determination. There's two forms of evidence that we need to prove a hate crime. It's two forms of evidence in any, any actual crime. You have testimonial evidence, based upon what someone's saying, what they're writing, you have that, and then you have the physical evidence. So if someone puts a cross on your lawn and they burn the cross and then maybe yell out something, well you know, based upon the physical evidence, what that means. Um, if uh, they have some writing and they've written some things and they speak it, you know, that's the testimonial part of it, and we can prove that. And so I would recommend that we support that. Thank you. Um, question from the former Vice Mayor, Ernie Sunga. Sorry, we don't have a portable microphone, but I have a portable uh, technique right here. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. And then next, the Mayor Sampaio. Former Mayor Sampaio has a question also. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, you know, I, I look at the ground, and I don't see any Asian statistics. And I know for a fact from yesterday's meeting that there are Asian feet plans for me that are not here. And I'm afraid that uh, based on the study that was uh, done pre COVID, that the main reason why Asian hate crimes are not reported is because our public safety uh, lacks the perception to accept that there are hate crimes dealing to fight against Asian. There are concentrations of hate crimes committed against Africa. And, and that's why the report said, maybe right, maybe wrong. So I think my question is, how can we capture this hate crime in the city of Ohio and identify it at the point that we are able to uh, put some solution to it? How could we reach out to our police uh, officers and tell them that hate crime exists against Asian Americans? And it has to be investigated, investigated as facts when it happens. That's, that's, that's a very, very, very serious issue. And uh, even the fact that Asian Americans don't report and make it harder. But now we are organized. We are really, really organized. Nationally, we are doing a rally on the 15th of May. And our group from Bolero is going to Sacramento to join the rally. And that rally is nationwide and two other Asian countries participating. And uh, what is gave me is uh, are we just organizing for the sake of spreading information? I hope we don't organize the young men because uh, this to be somewhat older as it is now. And it's very important. Is there any procedure that you think we should use to entice our Asian population to report any big crime? Well, it starts with me. I mean, it's important to the chief, it's important to my command staff that, um, the, that our community understand that you can report hate crimes, that we want you to report hate crimes. It is underreported, I believe. Many crimes are underreported. And I can't emphasize enough that if, you, if it is reported to us, it will be investigated vigorously. And I, you know, I want the public to understand that. I think education, like I said, public service announcements, putting this out on social media, putting it out on city websites, but just getting it out there. And then making it easier um, in terms of maybe a platform that you can report online if you don't want to come to the police department. You can just put what happened online. And so uh, that is something that we're going to be looking at. We do have online reporting. Uh, if there's a suspect involved, that system doesn't accept that information. And so we need people to call 911. Just call, and we'll take the report, and we'll follow up on it. But I, I do agree with you. I, I don't believe that it is underreported, but we need the public assistance, and, and they have to call. Thank you.
Now, police, yes. So the police officers receive mandatory training in hate crimes. If they fail to take a report when it comes to hate crimes, that's a serious violation, that's misconduct. So they have to, it's a mandatory report, they have to take that report. If I hear about them not taking a report, that's not good. So they are required to take the report, and they will take the report. We have really good officers that do an outstanding job every day, and if you call, we will come and they will take that report. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mayor Zimbayan, former Mayor Zimbayan has a question. And then I'll take one more question, two more questions, then we're going to go to the next topic. And then we'll do the start of that presentation, and then we'll have more time for Q&A after that. Because we wanted to make sure that the presenters uh, get a chance to uh, do the presentation. So two more questions, so yes, for Mayor Zipai. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank the, uh, the Soviet community for putting this event on, uh, Vice Mayor. Very much appreciated. This goes to the whole crux of what we're facing today with the AAPI and the crimes against us, that this is a start and it's not the end. Just like all the other struggles minorities have faced throughout the years, this is just another one that's going to go on that notch of struggles. But my question to both of you, and I, again, I want to thank you and your staff for being here. Now, this, this is really good. But, the big question for me is, I've been asked when I shop at uh, Seafood City, or when I go out to Springstown to shop at the, the Filipino markets there, the, the comment that I hear a lot of is, we never see the police. We never see the officers fighting for our lives. I was there the day that the seven people in the minivan had their hand broken into, and when you were officers was there to take a report, and they were just, they're visiting our country, and they fall victim. They're visiting our country, they're going for it, they're visiting the land. So what is their impression of our community? I guess Chief, and Chief Kemp, I, I understand we're shorthanded. We all, we all know that. But can we utilize other resources? Can we, I mean, COP is still active. At least I believe they are, is that correct? If they're still out there, can we use them for direct patrol? We have cadets still. Can we use them for direct patrol? Sure, they're not driving police vehicles as they used to in the past, but they're still driving the white uh, explorers with the light bar with the logo on the side. That's inherent. And those types of things are what residents are asking me about. And Hence, I'm going to be laying it out to you. So, my question is, can we get more visibility on our road? Thank you. Visibility is important uh, for law enforcement. And as you know, the former uh, mayor understands that we are probably one of the most likely staff police departments in the Bay Area. You couple that with the, uh, the amount of calls for service that we get, uh, it is staggering that the way it operates the way it has uh, for the number of years. So I did do a proposal for exceptional policing. Um, I have recommended back in March of 2020 that our staff level should be about 181 police officers. And that's based upon uh, what I believe uh, would be the best staff level uh, with the calls for service violent calls. We had 28 murders, 269 shootings last year in our city, that's violent crime. In addition to that, um, rapes were higher and when you look at aggravated assaults, very high for our city. And we wanted to lower that. That's why Operation Peace, which I'm going to talk about, was really important. We had to uh, bring that level down. Operation Peace has been very successful uh, in the last six months. We've made over 151 arrests. Um, I have some of the stats, I'll go over that in a uh, briefly, but it has um, produced about a 20% reduction in violent crime uh, since the start. And so it has been successful, but it is a collaborative effort between us, the police, the community, our partners, and so it's important. We're also deploying technology so that we can be more efficient and effective, and we can stop uh, violent perpetrators that are doing this. In addition, what we did at the beginning of this year, um, we used to, officers were doubled up in cars, and they, they were two-person cars, so we called. 
Well, now they're single person cars so that we have more cars and more visibility on our streets. In addition, we uh, have what we call police assistants. They're like community service officers. They respond now to take reports. So there's more visibility, but there's better service. We want to expand that so that lower level calls that are cold calls that a civilian can take for us, uh, it frees up the officers so that they can be more visible. That's a more efficient way of working. And that's what we're doing. That started this year, we want to expand that, but it is resource dependent. Um, so we will need uh, to put more emphasis on adding those resources so that we can have better security and safety in our city. Okay. Thank you, Chief Williams. Uh, Victoria Grace, you had a question? Ruth. And then uh, tell me about the next, and then we'll do the uh, next presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you guys definitely for doing this presentation here um, and really showing us that you guys are proactive. Uh, I also appreciate that you mentioned in prevention that outreach um, and education in the schools is a priority. And I was wondering, you know, we, we in the, I grew up for the school district and, and it's very hard having these conversations with kids that don't necessarily understand the historical context or you know, what's going on in the world with politics and everything right now. Um, these types of things start out as bullying in, in our schools and they learn to hate and they grow to hate and now we see that this is a crime. Um, what kind of programs or what do you guys plan on utilizing to get into the schools and start teaching our youth and our kids about, one, what is a hate crime, why are they hate crimes, and what can they do about it? Well, we appreciate that. I believe that collaboration with the superintendent, with our school uh, teachers, with some of our community-based organizations are important. I, the police, we cannot do everything, so I would form partnerships uh, with our uh, school staff, like I said, the school superintendent, NAACP, our group here, and so that we could uh, create a, a outreach um, and explain what they're trying to do. Part, right? Explain what it looks like um, in terms of bullying because that's how it does start. And so we do need to do prevention with our children um, as they go up. I know in college it's required orientation when it comes to hate crime. Well, that also needs to be part of our uh, high school, our middle schools, our second, our uh, elementary schools. It needs to be part of that and it needs to be repeated uh, to our children. Tell me about the last question and then we'll proceed to the next one. Oh, you're going to give me, I only have one more question. No. Okay, uh, Eloise, we'll give it to Eloise. Eloise Scott. Good afternoon, I'm the new sister. Um, to, with regards to the victim, the preparing victims are the elderly. This happened mostly in Cebu City. Lots of the snatching, and then they just destroy their car. So we really ask you, how would you recommend to prevent this crime? Mostly of the elderly. And last month, a man was walking from the, you know going home at uh, Delta Meadows. He was the by uh, back. And many, many of our people doesn't like to report because they don't like to go over to the court or um, their name will be in the newspaper. So there are lots of our people who have been victims of this crime, of hate crimes. So I would like to uh, keep up. If you could do something, if you could do, how can we prevent this, especially in in uh, city? city. So uh, thank you for the question. I think what uh, former Mayor Bob Sabayo said is that it's it's really awareness. And I think that's what the community, especially the AAPI community, is doing right now. Awareness. Uh, understanding safety, personal safety. We're asking folks to be very, very careful what they carry, where they walk. In addition to that, uh, we're really, really trying our best to get
get extra patrols. So I know we're short on police officers. So the next thing is, what are the alternatives? As the chief mentioned, whether it be community police officers, cadets, just much more, you know, maybe non-gun bearing officers out there for uh, awareness. The last thing is that a lot of the private businesses that we work with, we encourage private security. So again, a lot of that has to do with budget. It's not always the answer. But really, really, what I'm seeing across the nation is what we're doing now is getting together, acting in solidarity against these uh, attacks, and it's really, really awareness. Um, we just have to be very careful when we walk around. Thank you, thank you very much. So we'll go to the next uh, part of your presentation, Chief Williams. Thank you.
Friends of the Police Department. In addition to that, we've got those steps. We're going to have a community room. Uh, a lot of departments across the nation have a community room such as this where you can rent out and host meetings. So it's going to be open to the public. You can just sign up. It's free. And that's it. And the very right side of that is the parking lot for the police department. And as you can see, uh, we'll have the pre-processing area. But that's essentially what the, what the community department is. In addition to that, we're going to have what you call a, a Community Assistance Resource Center. This is going to be kind of a multidisciplinary interview center for adult victims, child victims. We're going to collaborate with the detectives along with the nonprofit organizations to deliver uh, a way that we can interview this victim. It's a one-stop shop, and um, this way they don't have to go all the way up to Fairfield. Currently, at the police department, we don't have this. Finally. It's, uh, it's, it's cost effective. We already bought the building for $13.5 million. Uh, based on uh, the projections, we're looking at $30 to $35 million for the upgrade and retrofit, which is about $47 million in savings. On average, if you bought a brand new building and built it from scratch, it's close to $95 million. And that's from scratch. The building really exists. Recruiting, retention, responsiveness. I talked about that already. Everybody wants to have a nice place. Right now we're recruiting officers and we take them to the old building for a tour. This is where you're going to be working. In addition, our dispatch center is actually in the basement of the police department. No windows, poor ventilation. Our plan is to put them up on the second floor looking over uh, the water. Um, and if, if, if for those of you that ever have a working environment where 12, you're 12 hours on and you have just limited breaks, it's not a comfort. Accessibility we talked about for both the community and the police officers, and finally it's obviously modern and it falls into the um, theme of 21st century police. And that is it. So I'm not sure if you want to take questions now or we'll send it to Mr. Delisle. We'll take questions later because I want to make sure that we're covering everything. Yeah. Okay. Operation Peace, really quickly. Operation Peace is a community um, project that we, it's a crime reduction program. And it's not only crime reduction, but it's also a community engagement program. So what does Peace stand for? Operation Peace stands for Predictive Enforcement and Community Engagement. Predictive Enforcement and Community Engagement. Why was it created? Uh, because of the spike in violent crime. Um, we had, like I said, 269 shootings last year. We had 28 murders. Crime was increasing at a just unprecedented rate in our city. And so uh, Operation Peace was created. Um, it's a four-part plan. One was to redeploy officers to the areas where those shootings were happening. Uh, two, it was to develop partnerships with our federal, state, and local partners. Um, and we did that. Um, three, it was to utilize technology. And so we utilize technology to enhance how effective we can be. And four, what we call the four C's. And that's cops, clergy, community, and um, council members, right? Or community and council members, all working together. So that was the community piece. So we had an Operation Peace Community Task Force, and they've done different events, clean up events, um, different events uh, throughout the city. Um, but we also had um, our federal, state, and local partners for six months that did um, enforcement. Enforcement on the people that we believe are the prolific offenders in our city that were causing a lot of those shootings. So I'm just going to give you some of the results on that. In a six month period, we made 151 arrests. We had 75 uh, recovered uh, guns. We seized over uh, 10 pounds of controlled substances. That doesn't include 22 kilos of, uh, I think it was uh, heroin that we seized uh, in conjunction with another state agency. We had eight pounds of uh, marijuana seized, two meth laboratories um, that were seized, and a uh, pill press. What's really important is just not the numbers, it's what happened after the enforcement. Like I said, there was a 20% reduction in violent crime and it was in that uh, six month period. And it's not in, I mean, Operation Peace is continuing. And we're going to continue to do this. 
Um, our operation of peace officers that we redeployed took 60 guns off the street the first two months of the year. That's a gun in the day. So they are doing an outstanding job. And it's really important that we are proactive because reactive policing is not effective. Proactive policing, when you're in the right areas, is effective. And um, it's, it's been successful. I can take any questions if you have. Yeah, well, I want to defer the questions later. I want to make sure we get Tom Delosandro's uh, uh, presentation. Very interesting presentation. This is an update on what's going on at Mare Island, North Mare Island. So Tom Delosandro is uh, 31 years of experience. He started when he was 10. <laughs> and uh, Chief William started when he was 16. So anyway, he um, is the president of Sutherland Corporation, West Coast uh, Regional Office, and is in charge of Mayor Island's development. So let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Tom D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Um, you know, some of you may be thinking, well, this is really shifting gears pretty dramatically to go from uh, Chief William to me. But I will tell you, you may not know this, but we're co developers in Mare Island. For Mare Island to be successful, I have to attract residents, I have to attract people who want to move here, I have to attract businesses who want to move here. I have to track, attract guests who want to visit here as a jumping off point for visiting wine country or just as a great place to be. And so the work that you're doing is really foundational. Your success is really required for my success. And I think that what we heard today was so important and so impressive and uh, I really appreciate I'm so happy you invited me. <laughs> Just to meet both of you and, and hear what you're doing. Um, for Mayor Island to be successful, we have to entice people to want to move here and, and join us. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some ideas <coughs> regarding Mayor Island and some of the things that we're going to be showing you. So I know um, that I've been teasing you for a year now. I've been here about a year and I keep saying, well, we're going to show you stuff, we're going to show you stuff. But I want to show you some precedents and some principles that when you see stuff, and you will be seeing very soon, uh, you will understand some of what's motivating us. So, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we're working with HOK, as many of you know, but we're layering in some other architects. So we want to have multiple architects working on their island. And this is so that it's a richer perspective. We have different people viewing it differently and seeing different things. I've worked on many projects that have gotten, uh, that have been very much loved by uh, the communities I've built in. And part of it was having multiple perspectives, including community input, uh, but also architecture. So HOK is still involved, but in the historic core, I wanted to bring in someone named Alan Ward with Sasaki and we're looking at how do we redevelop and how do we develop mixed uses and why are mixed uses important. Uh, so there's the next slide. Uh, and so Alan Ward has worked on the Lincoln Memorial redevelopment. He's worked on the Federal Reserve redevelopment. And the Home Office of Boston, the redevelopment park down there in Boston. Next slide. Uh, and so we're bringing him to look at the historic to complement what HOK has been doing. So the historic core, as are probably all of you know better than me, but you know, here we have the gantries inside the control in the museum and the promenade along the water and then the river. Uh, and we're, this is really where Maramon started. This is where the Navy started their buildings. These are the most historic buildings. These are some of the most powerful architectural buildings. And so we think this is a very special place. Now, when you get used to seeing me, you'll see every place I talk about on our island is very special. But this has the most history, and it has the most, you know, it is really one of the major waterfronts. Um, and so we're looking at some principles for what makes a place comfortable for people. 
And actually, this does have an impact on time. I mean, when a place is, it, it, it invites a lot of people to show up, that tends to just having places populated, tends to reduce crime. Uh, but it's designed for the right scale for us. So that we, when we're there, we just feel comfortable. We feel like this is where we belong. It creates open space that create a place. You know, a lot of our island today is just a sea of asphalt. That made sense when we were moving nuclear subs around, but it doesn't make sense when we're just trying to feel comfortable in place. Um, it's distinctly urban and walkable. We, we just feel more comfortable when we're, we can bike or walk around. We don't have, we're not com compelled to be in a car to go to where we need to go. Uh, it includes decompression, just places we're always we're so busy, we're running, we're juggling so many different things, and just having places where we can relax and just decompress. We want to include them in our planet. And then we have the right mix of activities. We have some civic anchors, we have places to go dine, we have places for a concert. And then we have options for living near here. So a lot of people, you know, we have we have a residential in one section and a downtown in another. And we're trying to say a lot of people want to live closer to where the activities are, the next slide. So we're looking at human scale. How do we walk to work comfortably? You know, we, you know, again, we want to say, we want to be car light. And I think we've been, you know, even before I got here, you know, the, 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 there's a series of families that own their island, the Lawrence family, Finney's, Sebastian Lane, and now Southern Lands, which is run by, owned by Tim Downey. And so it's, it's a family, kind of a series of family run groups, and this commitment to, you know, a comfortable place, walkable, designed to be able to use the next building. And all of these, most of these images are things that, so, that Alan Moore worked on. So we want a, a hierarchy of streets, and, you know, again, when you go to our island, most of you just see asphalt. You know, when you're in a historic car, you just see acres and acres of asphalt. And so we're now saying, how can we bring in trees, bring in places that are designated for bicycling, make it clear where people can walk. So we're just trying to take the same space, but now design it for us. Next slide. Uh, again, we're like, again, creating these places where people can mingle, where we have dining, and the shopping, and again, the walking, just relaxing, uh, and the streets are fine. And this is the kind of place that people like to spend time in. Um, and so we're talking about human scale, connecting, mixing and uses, and then really thinking about making things attractive. So uh, one of the things that Alan worked on, Alan worked on is the Chicago River, the redevelopment of the waterfront, and creating places that people, uh, many people, born and raised in Chicago, have never even been there. You know, they went across the bridges, but they never walked down and, and got close to the river. And this has transformed the, the downtown of Chicago. So then we're doing developing phases. We're looking at doing this at a human scale, connecting with, mixing the users, being attractive, and developing phases. Well, Mare Island could never be done in a phase. It could never be, we could even dream of it. But how do you think about doing it in phases where you're building each phase and builds the foundation for something stronger and richer? So how do we look through the phasing is important. Next. And activity. You know, the thing that makes, you know, all of this can be great, but if there aren't events, if there aren't reasons to go, you know, if there's a concert Saturday night, or if there's, a, you know, an Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday, and, you know, but just thinking about all the things you can be doing to bring people in, but we're designing to do that. We're designing the space so that we're anticipating the kind of events we want to hold the next time. Uh, and then the end, as much as important as it is to have things that are energize us and connect us with other people. Sometimes we like to be in a place where we can, I can just do nothing. Just exhale. And so we're looking to make sure we introduce, as we might say, on the eastern part of the island, we have all of the factories and all of the asphalt and all of the energy. And on the west side, you have all of the, the nature and the, and the very serene. And how can we bring this together? How can we connect them and make the connection between the very soothing and serene open space and the energy that we want in the factory area. Next slide. So those are kind of some of the broader goals. And now it's going to be how can we apply them to Mare Island? If we, if we take those principles that we want to do, 
Let's tie them in our mind and what to the early core, the historic core. So we want to make a new place in the historic center. When we do we do our remarkable search, we find the two things that people find the most compelling about their island. What is it? What are the best ways of enticing people to move there, enticing their business to move there? One is, you know, it's 5,000 acres in our island. 4,000 of it is open space, you know, the preserve and all the western open space land. So we really have an incredible, we have seven, eight miles of waterfront. You know, at San Pablo Bay and Straits and not the river. So where else can we find that? So, but it's underutilized, it's under celebrated. And so we're looking at how can we take advantage of all of that open space and make more trails and make it more animated, but still keep it serene. Uh, but then um, the other aspect, in addition to nature, is the historic structures that are so rich in history. And I don't mean, you know, I don't want to insult you because you know that more than me. But the history of Nara is part of what people want to belong to places that are authentic, that have a place in history, that are not just anonymous or, you know, don't have any character. So those buildings each has a story, and, and, and part of that is what makes people interested in moving there. So how do you create a new place? You know? What building is so that? Um, so then we're just looking at the history and what we're looking at. Um, and so we look at, for example, in Portland, at the Down Guard, where you can see here, it's hard to see, but here you have some of the um, cranes, and you have some of the, like, the gantry and the big structures. And so, again, the person who took out, took a look at that and said, how can we integrate that into the design? So then the next slide. And, and so, you have, you know, when you're looking at how these very modern new buildings, because you really don't want to try to match the old. You really want to kind of celebrate them by being distinct from them. How would you kind of create these new buildings that incorporate the historic buildings and the historic structures in them and make them a part of the experience? So again, this is another way to do the Zell Yards in Portland. And it's kind of a precedent. We're not going to Xerox anything, we're going to kind of copy anything. We're going to study these and say what work. And what's going to be relevant here? The next. Um, and this is just a land. Uh, and then in China, uh, the 798 project. So this is, was a munitions factory in China that they closed down outside of Beijing, really. And uh, Alan worked on this plan of bringing in nature, bringing in you know, some place making. So it's, a, it's an artist, it's kind of an arts and innovation center now. And, um, so we see again how these old structures, these historic structures, can be revitalized by being incorporated into a new land. Um, and they also work with Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, which is probably one of the most successful, if you've been to it, one of the most successful military based redevelopments. And so we're trying to again take the best ideas from around the world for how to redevelop industrial zones. So then it's how can we create an enhanced public use in this district. The next slide. So we have really a tremendous amount of acreage uh, of open space. Just again, you can see when I talk about just all of the asphalt that's all over. This is just here, seven and a half acres of asphalt. So it's huge. How can we make that work? The next slide. Um, so we only go back to the Chicago Water County again as an example of precedent. Just what ideas can we take or borrow? Um, and here's another example of this house, kind of made, but yes, it's a park on one side, but it's also a dining area. So we're bringing in food, and we're bringing in reasons to be there. Right? And we're also looking at sustainability, so that these, these plants are actually also creating underwater a habitat for fish. For fish. It's a habitat for fish. So we're, we're looking at what can we be doing also as we introduce natural elements that make it more than just pretty. We might be so also helpful. Um, and then there's another one where we just try to bring the green spaces in. Because right now, while while it's wonderful to be on the promenade and it's wonderful to be in Kansas, it's also very hard to move on yeah. So again, this is Corpus Christi, same kind of ideas, how to make it playful. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Waterfront Park for the Los Angeles. Um, Again, just trying to animate, bringing activities in, events in, making it very pleasant. 
uh, rent a new grid and move to this very quickly. So this is really what we're saying. Well, this is a street. If we didn't have that pain, how would you know? Um, you know, but this is again, we use a sea of asphalt, and what can we do with it? So we can really take what are some examples of really wonderful streets, the landscaping, the scale, the paving, the how, how the public space is introduced, and this is part of what we're looking at in the infrastructure. Um, another slide, National Harbor. Um, now we're looking at the network, so then again, this is kind of all images of uh, Mare Island and how we have these beautiful spaces and how we connect them. Uh, and one of the ideas here is we want to take part of the asphalt and make a temporary space. So this is a temporary space in Boston called the Long D. But we just try, even if we don't have the final, final plans, let's just get something going. And so what we're looking at is what can we do to just create a, a meanwhile place, just to do something right. So this is another long and it swings and it had, you know, the bar lawns for yoga, etc. And evenings, food trucks, and just the place people like to be. Next slide. Uh, Addison Circle in, in, in Texas, outside of Dallas, uh, where the space is used for art festivals, food festivals, events of all kinds. And again, it's programming and making a lot. Uh, and children. So these are some uh, apartments coming up in Cincinnati. These are playgrounds for children. And we're not the conventional playgrounds, just trying to take them up a notch in terms of design and really make it the kind of place where people will drive farther to bring their kids here than just to make it a playground. Something really special. Okay. Um, and so that's really kind of uh, where we're looking. We're saying, you've seen the HSP program, or maybe many of you may have seen which looked at the entire island. And now we're saying that's from 30,000 feet. And now we're looking at the historic core and we're saying, getting closer to so being on the ground, how do we make each piece of Mare Island really special? So we intend to, in fact, we're talking to the city now, uh, Greg Scaff has, has, has seen some early ideas. We're beginning to shape the ideas for how we start in the historic core. We feel like it's the most important part of the island. We feel it's the part that has the most power, the most history, the most connectivity, and the opportunity to connect. And so while we haven't shown plans yet, we have been advancing the ideas, bringing in some new designers, working with big, making the architectural team broader. So I don't want to take up too much time. I, 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 I promised I would be brief, but I just wanted to say we are working on this and just tell you a little bit of the direction of life. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. First time, right? Correct. So I'm glad that we invited you. So we have about 20 minutes for question Q and A, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to answer a question. Pastor Obalde will have the next one, I believe, by Lani. I'm just going to have a question, and then uh, Greg Torres. So we'll take it in that order. Okay. Uh, Dr. Obalde. Dr. Obalde is president of the Valencia School Board. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the presentation earlier when uh, the Chief was sensitive to the uh, uh, introduction, yes, I would call it ethnic studies. And uh, we recently passed, the state of California passed the uh, ethnic studies requirement for graduation. And uh, many of us were part of that in enabling that to happen. I, for one, uh, as a trustee, believe that it should be introduced probably in about third grade. And, and we would not have the, the experiences of bullying, experiences of really uh, hurting each other, if we understand the contributions that many of us have made in this country. And contributions not only in material things, but 
spiritual uh, uh, business and so on and so forth. So it is for time, and I appreciate you being sensitive to that, and I was very pleased to hear you respond to that. And I, I also would encourage you, and I commend you also for uh, having dialogue with your superintendent. My understanding is that you have two of you been meeting, and uh, I commend you for doing that. Uh, in the past, we have not done that. The only time that we have had the opportunity to talk with the chief of police was when we developed the SRO. And now, uh, obviously, that is questioned. But I was also, uh, uh, I helped bring the SRO in the uh, schools. The question I have is in regards to the lack of reporting, many uh, people are really, really very uh, shy about making reports. The question, part of that, I believe, is the undocumented. And what is the, what is the law in regards to people who have been harmed? and have been victimized who happen to be undocumented. That's one. Well, in Vallejo, we do not investigate. We're not immigration enforcement. So um, if you are undocumented, it doesn't matter. You should come forward and, and talk to us. You know, before I became a police officer, I played international basketball. And I actually got married in Mexico. So my wife is Mexican. She's American now. But if we only speak Spanish, so I am very sensitive to that. If there's there is no question that anyone, anyone in our city can come forward, it doesn't matter if you're undocumented or not. Um, you can report a crime and we will follow up on that crime. We are not immigration enforcement. That's good to know. Uh, may, I, may, may I give you a critique of the uh, the visual show that, that you showed uh, uh, Chief Buck here? I've noticed that the pictures that you show there. Uh, you know, Malaya is known to be one of the most diverse city in the country. And yet, the pictures that so there were all Anglos. In, a, in front of the police department, the new police department, the citizens there that are walking around, they're all Anglos. Which one is that one? Which one? <laughs> so I just, I can't, I could not relate to it for a while there. But I have to understand. You know, and they were just wearing masks and they were yeah, we have a company that lays out for us, and so it's a conceptual uh, rendering of it, so it's all computer animated. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we have to relate to it, sir. Yeah. You're you It's an honest uh, evaluation. Thank you. Yeah, you can use these local people as models for your next rendering. It's uh, volunteers for the next uh, presentation. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate very much you being here, Chief. And I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, sir. And uh, so, uh, thank you so much for providing this experience. We would not have this opportunity if we had not had the problem of anti-hate. Normally, we would be quiet and would be, you know, at home crying our tears out. But the fact that this is happening and that we are organizing, I'm not, I'm not even involved in that tomorrow's webinar webinar from the uh, uh, AAPI Christian for Biden. And we were having that now, a webinar tomorrow with African American throughout the United States that we are in dialogue. Asian American leaders are now in dialogue to talk about prevention. And we can, uh, we can learn a lot from the African American, obviously. Um, and so, the other thing is, please know that, uh, that uh, we will do everything we can to, to be supportive of one another and, and to be in solidarity. Uh, we had a solidarity meeting the other day, Friday, and it was nice to see a lot of police officers here that really care. They, you know, they look like they're, they're really uh, uh, protecting our backs because they're our fingers. And, and many of them are at, uh, uh, real and sometimes not real. And so uh, we need to be in dialogue and open to the continued uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. So we have 15 minutes here. Please so shorten your comments and focus on the question, okay? But this is just a start. We want as many more opportunities to have dialogue. But I have Leilani Casada, and then next is Greg Torres, and then Chris Villanueva, and then Jen Mojica. Please ask the question and show us.
from the proponents at least on the answer. We don't have 15 minutes left. Thank you.
Yes, with the Nueva, and then it's Jamie Mojica, and then in the back I have Lucy Martin, Alex, and Norma Fonsetti. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for working here, Chief, and the other rest of the speakers. During uh, our time uh, in the 90s and uh, the late uh, 90s and early 80s, uh, we established substations over the We started the uh, Neighborhood Association, and the substation is manned by a few hours of police and most of the volunteers from the neighborhood. And I think we dropped the criminalities uh, substantially using this community based policy. Is there any idea where we will involve again the various neighborhood and creating some kind of a substation to each and every uh, area that are applied with, uh, with uh, criminalities? I agree with you, sir. Um, neighborhood policing is really important. Um, that is one of the recommendations from the actual assessment that we have, is to have neighborhood police officers, um, but it is resource dependent. And so it's dependent upon us being able to hire, attract, retain more uh, police officers. The current facility that we're currently in, we need to be out of that facility in a better facility. Then we can start to think about having satellite facilities throughout the city. But that is dependent upon research. Um, when you're talking about those numbers in, 19, in the late 1990s, early, there was 156 officers. They had more police assistance. They just had, there was more resources here. But the bankruptcy crippled this department and it left it half the size of what it was before. And so we need to rebuild, but that's going to take time and it's going to take finances um, and resources. But I do agree with you, we need to have officers um, walking the beat, right? Getting to know the neighbors and being visible. And that in itself is a return to the crime. Thank you. Thank you, police chief. Jenny Mohinka, question. And then uh, Lucy Martin and then Norma and then Council Member. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about the timeliness of hate crimes being reported and assessed. And so as it was shared, you know, there's a lot of instances where it's not being reported. And as we, like my generation, you know, we're the, we're the kids, we're the grandkids of our elders. And so we also want to wake up our generations to equip our elders to defend themselves, but also be available to step in a little bit more, taking them to the store, accompanying them wherever they're going. And as I see the data slide, and it says zero hate crimes in 2021, but we see it in the paper, it gets reflected in stories. Saturday there was a solidarity rally and prayer, and we heard a number of stories there. How does that get reflected, even if it's happened in the past? You know, because we want that data to show as well, because I, I think people will look at it, our families, and the community will say, oh, it's not happening here, we're good right now. But the truth is, it is happening. And how do we connect those dots so that, so that the data shows, in addition to the efforts that we are trying to, to use to support our elders? Education, I mean, we have to educate each other to, to call. And if, if, it's your, if it's your grandfather or your father or someone in your family that you know, encourage them to call because they have to call in order for us to get um, the information. So once we get the information, we can begin to, to follow up. So it is education and public service announcements. It's getting the word out that you have to call. And um, that's the one thing I can't do. I can't force someone to call. Um, but we can encourage, we can educate. And um, walking with your elders, that's really important too. I mean, walking in pairs instead of by yourself. Most of the crimes are committed when you're by yourself. And so if you can get together with people, that's an added layer of, of prevention and protection. Yes? And Chief, is there a timeline? So it's, if it happens some time ago, is it, is it still acceptable to step forward and, and, and call it in? So yes. there's a story we had, I mean, young ladies had shared it. There was a gentleman that came and spoke about his being five year old father that was attacked on Meadows Drive, but I'm certain it wasn't you know, reported. But you hear it from his 
story. <coughs> is it too late or could it be still uh, accepted to be recorded? So the statute of limitations and adults, you can always report <coughs> the statute of limitations for prosecution on uh, a misdemeanor crime would be a year, but for the felony crime, it could be three years. If it's a sexual crime, that's a different statute. <coughs> there is no limitation. So yes, you can call. Just call. And we'll figure out what it is for us. Us getting the information is important because maybe that person is still victimizing others. Like that's really the big report. Call. We need the phone number later for Chief um, Lucy Martin's next, and then Norma Pasado, and then Council Member. Yes, I have to get my suggestions. I have two: one suggestion and one question. One suggestion in order to create awareness without the same high school needs, this is where I work them for almost 20 years. What about if we create like a club that um, the police could connect, creating a club with our high school kids so that they are aware of what is going on? And also, yes, that one thing I forgot the other thing, but I want to say that. Um, what about promoting like a logo to the um, statement saying something? Um, we promote love, not hate, kind of thing. You know, high school kids, when you ask them, they're very nervous out of it, and they can help you. Not only high school, high school kids, but I'm saying that this, this is where I work. I work with them. And also, awareness means they don't even know who is our chief of police. So that adds on to it. They, they, they now be aware if we have a group in, in our schools. Um, number two, my question is, how fast are you in responding to crime calls? Because I was there at the city when the seven women were robbed, were burglarized their car. I parked near them. And I waited until the police came. A uh, woman police came after 18 minutes. And they were like crying. I was there. I was supposed to leave right away in an apartment, but I have to stay because it happened to me too at Seafood City, but not during your time. It happened to me eight years ago. And the, pol the police never came. So that's my question. How fast are you now that you are our chief of police? To arrive when someone calls you for help. I mean, your man. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Ramika, for inviting me. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know about this event without you telling me. And I also spread it in this research. And I have one more thing. There is one student actually who knows you because you had a program going on. I don't know what kind of program, but when I asked Dan, because I, I started teaching, I mean, my lesson is. Um, I started teaching them about AAPI because this month of May is a, uh, Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So thank you. So uh, I, I actually think that's a great idea to have high school students um, help prepare an education or advertisements. That's a great idea to get them involved. Um, the question about response times. So, uh, Deputy Chief Kim of Overseas Communications, we're reviewing our response times, but I can tell you we need to do better in, uh, in terms of our response to crimes like that. We prioritize our crimes uh, based upon a threat to life, right? So, a priority one call would be if your life is in imminent danger. So, the officers have to get there. They go code three, that's what they call it emergency lights and sirens. So, they get there as fast as possible. Our officers have to be available for those party one calls. If it's not a life threatening emergency, it's going to be a slow response. Thank you. Yes, so, so the calls for service are divided up. For example, the priority one call that's a person getting her life is in danger. That's going to require a speed response, probably depending on the availability, six to ten minutes, for example. If it's a car being verbalized, we would consider that a priority two or priority three call. And the reason is there's no immediate threat to life or safety. So what happens is uh, 
we require these two officers to go to the priority one calls because it's using for officer safety, they can't go by themselves. Now you're gonna have to wait for those two officers or at least one of them to free up and come over. So we average about seven officers on the per shift. And we average on a daily around 190 calls for service them on a 24 hour period. So to answer your question, if it's a priority call, for example, a burglary would, if you say, I walk to my car, there's no suspects around, the window's smashed, and my person's gone. That's going to be considered a priority two or priority three call because now you have to wait for the rest of the calls to finish. So it could take 18, I think you said 18 to 20 minutes, right, uh, for them to respond, depending on how many officers you build. But we are working on uh, alternatives, like the uh, former member said, community service officers that potentially could take those reports, cadets that could potentially take those reports. We're also looking at online reporting as an option, depending on the type of call, as an alternative uh, to free up the officers. We are definitely looking at alternatives. Hey, I think this is now. I'm going to have to have Norma because we're almost. Unless you want to stay until 8 o'clock and I'm fine with that. Okay. But for those who might want to. Go ahead, Norma. Hopefully. There were crazy call, verbal, untied, Asian assaults reported during pandemic. What police and our community can do with this issue and problems in our community? I just want to make sure I understand your question. So your question is, what can we do about these issues regarding uh, attacks on the AAPI? Is that your question? Right. So uh, I'm listening to, and I think that question has came up a couple times. Uh, number one, what you're doing right now is getting together the solidarity, the awareness, the margins. Uh, but you know what, ultimately it comes down to a lot of personal safety. You know, you only, you only have a certain amount of police officers available. Um, so you really have to now take into your hands when you're walking, is it nighttime, daytime, in a crowded area, where do you park your car? It's a lot of the crime prevention methods that's really going to be an individual decision whether you're walking by yourself or walking alone. The police just can't be everywhere. Now, are we working with the community like this? Yes. Are we working with Seafood City? Are we having different alternatives to have security, better lighting, we're working with public works, we're working with roads? Those are absolutely options that are not law enforcement related. But really, what I'm hearing, and again, I listen to the news and I study, I talk to my counterparts in different cities, is a lot of it is going to be individual safety because it's going to be really up to you to really take care of yourself and being aware of the surroundings and being aware of the, uh, of the situation. Hopefully, once COVID is finished, uh, we can get our, our crime prevention folks out there again, our community service folks from CSS, we call it the Community Services Division, and they can go out and start putting on some presentations focusing on that issue. Thank you, Thank you, my question is to you. I think that uh, as a member of the black community, it's been very disappointing to see uh, you know, black assailants where it looks like they're attacking uh, Asian members of the community, particularly knowing that we all share the burden of oppression, capitalism, uh, colonization, racism, and things like that. You know? and so I think from the black community standpoint, when you talk to some of your peers in the Bay Area, are these crimes? being grouped with other hate crimes, let's say from COVID-19, as Mrs. Placido said, um, are these kinds of poverty where you see a lot of young people robbing people, things like that, or is it a combination of both? Because my concern is, if we just group it as hate crime, we're not really addressing some of the issues, economic issues and disparities uh, in the community. So I had an opportunity to speak with the open chief about what's going on. And when the Oakland Chief spoke, he talked about the assault on elders. And so he focused more that this crime was against our elders. And so when I spoke earlier in the evening, this is something I haven't seen in 20 years where um, people are being attacked, our elders are being attacked. That has to stop. And so I don't care uh, what race you are, you have to respect your elders. That should be universal. That respect should be universal. I see on the, I don't know the numbers that I've looked at the data because um, I haven't seen it here in Vallejo. 
but I have seen it on the news in San Francisco and Oakland. And so, you know, it's really important to be data driven to look at the, the statistics. But what I have seen, it is disturbing. It's despicable that that can happen to our elders. And it is happening to our aging elders. And so it's, it has to stop. And so, I, you know, I had that, that conversation with, with the Oakland chief, but it was more about um, the, the age of the victim um, that he's looking at. Okay. And just only to follow up on what I've seen, because I'd love to learn more about, you know, some of the people, perpetrators who've been caught, you know, are they being motivated by race? And, and like you said, uh, seniors and things like that. I mean, what, what are their motivations here as far as why are they now, like you said, attacking our seniors? Um, but also the majority of the day. Yes, well, in my opinion, then it's heartless. I mean, in order for you to do that, you have to be cold-blooded yeah. um, to do that. And so, it does my personal opinion. I know hate is, you know, my, my personal opinion is probably has something to do with that. Yes, and I think it has to be whole or in part um, for it to be a, a hate enhancement, a hate crime. However, um, the, the, the sad part that is happening to our health. Thank you. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I, have to end, I, I have to end the questioning on the hate crimes and the uh, Asian uh, um, crime religion stuff because I wanted to make sure I give an opportunity for folks who have a question, who have a question on the uh, Bear Island development and anything to do with the city budget and then also um, I don't know. <clears throat> I I uh, echo Councilmember Brown's comments. We have to take a deeper dive into that whole issue of, you know, black versus Asian, you know, racism, all those issues, because it will take another discussion, another meeting to, to uh, look into that. But yes, we'll team up, okay? All right, so any questions about Bear Island development? Yes, uh, Mr. Abadi. Development. Um, do you have a, uh, a list of the prospective uh, families yet? Because I heard that Netflix is looking at it also, putting in a studio. So I don't know if that's true. I know. Uh, we don't have uh, we are We are actually placing a particular focus on one industry that we see as very powerful. We have seven companies on Mare Island that are engaged in advanced manufacturing for digital design and fabrication. The biggest one, the one most people know, is Factory OS. And Sarah, they're working with software developer uh, Autodesk to revolutionize how homes are built. Uh, we have price on associates with I mean, We have seven, and what just happens when you have seven firms, probably with over a thousand employees who are in advanced manufacturing, you have almost a mini agglomeration that makes you more attractive to the next company and the next company. So we're looking to really say, let's try to choose our customer. Let's try to go after those customers because this is the future of manufacturing. So Mayor Island has a long history of being innovative in manufacturing. And this is the cutting edge. This is where industry is going. And we already have, again, seven firms. So we're looking at the MP factories, which is about, the MP buildings are about over a million square feet. And, and we're <coughs> making an effort to, we're working around, this is really a group that's all over the world. We're looking at how do we use the fact that we have so many people already on their island who are trained in advanced manufacturing. Everybody who's working in fact, they're right. They're likely to be using an iPod as a hammer. They're doing, they're doing so much more with software and programming. So we've developed, we're developing a set of skills that make us much more competitive. And beyond just the people, just we have so many computers and we have so many machines that are making things. So we feel like we'd like to see if we can strengthen, almost become maker I mean, really just become a place that's in, in the lead for advanced manufacturing and have a, a particular, it's just like you say, 
anything in Hollywood has a filament industry or Silicon Valley has software. We think we can make a decision and really do something special. So I'm not aware of that. We do have some studios that can talk to us. Um, I know that we've got any that are close to being signed. Um, but we do have a number of, we, we have more leasing activity. A pipeline now that's pretty strong. We are trying to make a particular effort to celebrate in an area where we think could impact all of the Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you. Greg, you have um, a few words, and then I have to call Pastor Obama because I don't want to just ignore him. Then I'm going to have you say a closing prayer if you would please do that later. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Those are always very exciting questions when you talk about Netflix and Bumblebee and all that good stuff in the film industry. We do have applications in Conway. Wouldn't necessarily know that right now. We do have an application to have a building upgraded to continue that. So we just have 13 reasons. So we always have, it, it, it's with the pandemic, it had to stop, but we're back in business now when it comes to them having an application that isn't specific to Netflix. It's Film Fair Island, which is a company that used to do that, but they did bring in Netflix to show because it shows, and it does look like that's proceeding uh, with an application. So stay tuned. That's that energy starting to rebuild itself at all. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I'm Tony Dutubaldi again. Just as a reminder, cityofbaleo.net. That is the website for the city. And baleopd.net is the website for the Baleo Police Department. There's a lot of information there. Okay. I'm Dr. Dutubaldi and then you will know, say the closing prayer. Go ahead. Very, very agree with uh, that. I think it is a positive thing to show that there are many of us are really, really ignorant of what's going on. Finally, just to add a little bit, the Tom Alessandro, the Alessandro, the Southern Land Corporation, they have a monthly virtual meeting. And, uh, and I have not seen many of you in that meeting, so I think there's a lot more outreach to the community it needs to happen so that folks like us, I, I know about it, but many of these folks, or I think most of these folks, have not even participated in that virtual meeting. If you could. I would say, I would say, if you give us the list of people you invite, if you invite everyone oh, to the next meeting, and they happen about once a month, and um, sometimes the topics will be very exciting. Sometimes we'll just be talking about geotechnical matters that you have to be a chemical engineer to avoid. But, Wonderful. And with your permission, you know, uh, Christina Lee has the email information for all of you. If you're okay, you can send that to uh, Dante Alessandro, and you will get notified of all these upcoming I, I have attended, I have attended to the
Thank you, God, for the blessings of our leadership. And thank you for the support that the community has given us this evening. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.